Okay, so let's get started. Welcome to the second lecture of this course on introduction to stacks and moduli. And today's goal is to explain, uh, you know, the the Italic experience, and then introduce formally the definitions of sites and, and sheaves on sites. Uh, in particular, that what we're going to do is sort of go, you know, in this diagram of, of schematic enrichments of schemes, we have we're going to sort of explain. Uh, this this trajectory here. We're going to introduce uh, pre sheaves and, and sheaves on uh, this the big Italo side of schemes. Um, and then next time we'll 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 we'll, we'll start approaching uh, this side of the picture. Um, but before yeah before getting started. Uh, I did want to, just to uh, elaborate on the references I mentioned last time, uh, and, and specifically um, Stacks references. So there's the three sort of classic books, well, maybe not classic, but three books on Stacks by uh, Le Mans More Belli, uh, and which uses the material of algebraic spaces from Knudsen. And then more recently, there's this book by, by Olson on algebraic spaces and stacks that does both, yes, algebraic develops both the theory of algebraic spaces and, and stacks. And, uh, you know, this is really, a, yeah, it's like a special reference for me because I learned it, I learned this material from Martin Olson, not so much from the book he wrote, but I was a member of the class that he taught, I think it was spring in 2000, 2007. And uh, yeah, I was a member of the class and that's where I really uh, learned stack theory very well. Um, and then, I'm writing uh, course notes, which I'm gradually expanding on, uh, which, and there's a lot of overlap with my course notes and, and all three of these references. Uh, maybe one big difference is that I'm not going to develop the cohomology of sheaves on, al on, on general algebraic stacks. Uh, that avoid, avoids a lot of sort of necessary uh, technical machinery that you need to develop if you do wish to discuss cohomology. But I'm going to go further with the development of the moduli space uh, of curves and eventually of the moduli space of vector bundles on a fixed curve. Uh, and then also, yeah, there's this, you know, spectacular, I mean, the ultimate reference is the Stacks project, which is uh, an exceptional reference, even for learning new subjects. It's, it's locally well written and uh, although sometimes, you know, can be overwhelming, partly because uh, the, the, a lot of work goes into proving what, like the most general versions uh, that, that, are, that are possible. And uh, my notes, on the other hand, I'm sacrificing generality from more of a streamlined exposition, trying to give the most intuitive argument. So whenever there's like a, a, an Ethereum hypothesis makes the argument simple, simpler, I'll impose it. And sometimes I'll restrict the characteristic zero just for simplicity. Uh, and finally, one other thing that I wanted to highlight is his recent notes by Halford Leisner that I've now linked to from my website. Uh, these are just like, I think he calls it introduction to moduli theory. And this, while there's some overlap with my notes, there's actually very, rather, rather little. His, his notes have a much larger goal. They're less, um, less self-contained and expository, but capture a much larger perspective of, of uh, moduli theory, including uh, recent developments. Um, yeah, so <laughs> there's a lot of references. In some sense, yeah, you, you should be, when you're uh, a, yeah, a graduate student, there's this concern of being overwhelmed by references. And I think this is true here. So my advice is just to pick one that, you're, that you feel comfortable with. And then whenever you're confused in that reference, then consult another source. Any, any questions? Okay, so let's jump into uh, the Atal experience. So, uh, so this is sort of a, a, another motivational section similar to last time, but we'll, we'll then, then move into formal definitions of sites and sheets later. But first I just wanna say some general things about the Atal topology. And to begin with, we should say, what is an atomorphism? Uh, and 
I'm always sort of surprised with graduate students, you know, I spend like a year learning Harshorn or their Keels notes, and then they're, they're not, they're, they're intimidated by this concept. But, for, but, you know, from my point of view, atalmorphisms are conceptually so much simpler than many other notions you already learned. You know, I mean, it, it's really just an algebraic notion of a covering space. So compared to like the notions of, of flatness uh, or even properness, like this is really a much simpler notion. Uh, and I think one reason why students maybe have difficulty with it is because it's unfor unfortunately really hidden in Hartshorn. The definition of a towel and smooth morphisms appear, but it's in section three, like the cohomology section and they're in exercises sort of hidden and, and certainly the, their importance is not uh, emphasize as much. And especially when you turn to moduli theory, because we're using the Italian topology, uh, yeah, we, we really need like a good fundamental understanding of, of Italian morphisms. Um, and maybe the second reason why some students find it confusing is because when you see it, maybe for the first time, you've just thrown a ton of different definitions at you. They're all equivalent, but they're actually, it's really difficult to prove uh, a, a lot of the equivalences between the notions for tau morphisms, just like with smooth morphisms or unramified morphisms. And, but I think this should be sort of really a blessing because it gives you many ways to think about an tau morphism. And, maybe, and you should just black box at first, the fact that they're equivalent and feel free to think about tau morphisms in any of these ways and then use these properties in, in, uh, for different exercises. So, um, so here we have, here I'm just restricting to schemes of finite type over the complex numbers, just because it's simpler to, to give these equivalences in that case, but all of this is holds more generally. Um, and so maybe the first definition we have uh, for, for an atom morphism is smooth of, rel of relative dimension zero. So you can take that to mean flat and all the fibers are smooth of dimension zero. Uh, and uh, and all fibers smooth of dimension zero, uh, or similarly, like you could say flat uh, and unramified. And here, unramified is just a condition on the fibers: is that the that all fibers x y, which which I'm using as this notation f inverse of y, is just the disjoint union. Uh, if, we, if we take y to be a complex point of just a disjoint union of, of, of complex points. Um, the equivalent, you say it's flat and the sheaf of differentials is zero. A, a nice, a really nice useful uh, condition, which sort of illustrates how it's kind of like a covering space map is this condition, uh, is that for all points, the map on completions should be an isomorphism. So here, here this is, uh, this is the completion. You know, the inverse limit of the quotient of the local ring by powers of the maximal ideal. And in algebraic geometry, this is really a useful gadget that had, captures a lot of the formal, formal geometry. Uh, and so this is saying they're formally isom isomorphic. And then moving on to this, this final condition here, or this additional condition here, uh, this is what you would call that this is the, what's called the lifting criteria for a talentless. And there's similar descriptions for smoothness and, and unramified. And the, and the condition is that whenever you have uh, a closed immersion of Artinian C algebras, so these, these, can, these could be, um, say, local Artinian C algebras, these are just like fat points of the scheme. And you, you, you have this lifting condition that uh, whenever you have this commutative diagram, then there exists a, a unique map here. Um, and I always think it's useful to interpret these technical conditions the first time in, in, in simpler ways. So maybe a, as an example, let's just specialize to the case where, you know, one example of a thickening is where this is the complex numbers and this is the dual numbers. And then, so yeah, so then this map just corresponds to a point Y in Y and a tangent vector. Okay. 
And so if you translate what this condition is saying is that then that then that this tangent vector or once and, and this then is like is, is then a point in, in, in hex. And so the, the condition then is that there's a unique lift of every tangent vector. Um, and in fact, if you move to the smooth case where your X and Y are smooth, then in fact, this is equivalent. It, it suffices to check it that it's a tau, suffices to check that it induces an isomorphism on tangent spaces. Uh, and I'm mentioning this here, emphasizing this lifting criterion for a tauness because we'll use a similar lifting criterion for uh, a tauness and smoothness for, for algebraic stacks. And you know, maybe you can see because it's sort of defined functorially by maps into it, it's a very useful criterion for the purpose of moduli theory. And it's sort of this lifting criterion that will allow us to conclude that MG is, is smooth. Um, and uh, okay, oh, okay. And I have a very simple example to the, to the, on the right-hand side. I'm always a, a big fan when, when you, for having the most simple examples as, as the first examples. And this is here, just a, a double cover of A1. And this is, uh, this map is, is a tau, except, you know, except at zero. Um, and I encourage you, if, if you're seeing this for the first time, is to go ahead and try to check that it's a tau using uh, as many definitions as possible. Um, and, and, and maybe for, from uh, another perspective, so, so yeah, in this definition, everything was over the complex numbers, but the, from an arithmetic point of view, it's also maybe useful to, to realize that if, if, if I have a field extension, then the induced map on spectrums is a tau, if and only if the field extension is, uh, is finite and separable. And um, maybe one way to see why the separable condition shows up is that, you know, tau morphism should satisfy, it should, is a nice property of morphism, so it should, particularly should be stable under base change. And if, if you have uh, a field extension that is not separable and you compute, you know, the base change of it, it along itself. In other words, you compute spec L cross spec L over spec K, and you compute what the tensor product is of L and L over K, uh, you see that you get something non-reduced. So it can't be, uh, it shouldn't be a tau. Well, you could also compute the sheet of differentials, or there's a lot of ways to see this. Um, so that's what, that, that's my attempt at expl explanation of what is, uh, it, in a tau morphism, but you're probably more interested in why do you care? Why do we care about the tau topology? Um, and, it, and so, yeah, one reason is that it, it allows you to zoom in in ways that the Zariski topology does not. And I, I kind of want to emphasize this perspective in another, in, in, through a number of examples. Um, but one way to say this is that sort of like, the, the tau topology is like putting on a new set of magnifying lenses for your algebraic geometry glasses that allows you to zoom in and see, actually, and see what you could actually already see with your differential geometry glasses. Or maybe from an arithmetic perspective, you know, it's also, it, it's, it serves the dual function of also like seeing what you could see with your Galois theory glasses because a lot of, uh, yeah, a tau, notions, uh, because yeah, a tau, uh, a tau descent is similar to Galois descent and so on. But let me try to convince you of this in examples. And the first example we're gonna, gonna consider is an irreducible curve with a node. So the first example here is understanding, yeah, we're gonna take this equation. So this is the equation of a, of a nodal cubic, of a plane nodal cubic. And you know, if you zoom in around this point in the Zariski topology, well, actually, yeah, if you, if you zoom in around that point in the Zariski topology, I mean, that's just zooming in is just removing a finite number of points. And you see that no matter how many points you remove and no matter how small your Zariski open is, 
it remains irreducible. But of course, in the analytic topology, you have two branches. It's clearly reducible in the analytic topology. Um, and we'll see that it's also reducible in the etal topology. Uh, and, and a way to see this is, is to realize that if you sort of formally adjoin a square root of x minus one, then this equation factors as y minus xt times y plus xt. Uh, and while we can't take square roots, uh, you know, well, you can't take the square root in the ring necessarily, you, you can emulate this by, by forming an extension of the ring. Namely, you adjoin a new variable to your ring, we call it t, which is the square root of x minus one. And then as, once you invert t, you can see that this map uh, is, is a tau. And because it factors, now because you have a square root, it actually, uh, it, it, uh, this c prime becomes, this becomes reducible. And here's my attempt at this picture here. This is a similar picture appears in Hartshorn. So this is, this is indeed covered in Hartshorn. I don't mean to, yeah, to say otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, so yeah, this is one reason. In the tau topology, you can separate an, a nodal cubic. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and also if you zoom in at this, at this point here and you, I, I just wanna, uh, and you compute the completion, which is what I was discussing before, you, you realize that also the completion is, is, uh, is reducible because uh, if, if you take, you can take the square root of X plus one in the power series ring just by taking a Taylor expansion of that. Uh, and you see that it factors. So that in fact, the, the completion it, it itself is also reducible. And so there's this analog between the Atal topology and also completions. And uh, right, so I'd like to sort of spell out that, that, that dictionary. Uh, and it's sort of based on this principle of art and approximation. Sorry, can I ask a question about that example? Sure. Um, so one of the definitions of Vital you gave uh, was uh, about the tangent spaces, but isn't the tangent space at the node here really different? Like, don't you not get an isomorphism of tangent spaces there? Uh, in, in, well, in this case, that, that, uh, at these two points have are, are mapping. Uh, there's two free images of the node here, so th these have two dimensional tangent spaces, and it is bijective there. Oh, oh, I see. Great, thanks. But also, if you wanted to check a town this using just a tangent space calculation, you need both both varieties to actually be to be smooth or or uh, normal suffices, I guess. Right, so uh, let, let me try to explain art and approximation because we'll use this. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, and it really completes this dictionary between the formal geometry and the Italian geometry. And the general principle is that anything that holds, any algebraic property that holds for the completion also holds in a Italian neighborhood. That's sort of the principle to think of. And uh, art and, but the precise statement is, is what's written here. So let me try to, to explain this. And it involves a number of te technicalities um, most of which you can ignore. So, uh, so let's, let's first start with, uh, with S here is an excellent scheme. So excellent is just, if you haven't seen it before, you should just think of it as nice. Um, and in particular, like anything that's finite type over a field or over the integers is, is, is excellent. I mean, that, that's a theorem in itself, but let's just accept that. So this, you should just think that this applies for finite type schemes over a field of the integers. But, uh, but if you want to dive a little bit deeper, one of the conditions, one of the conditions is that uh, for every local ring, the map to the completion is what's called regular. So regular ring homomorphism, which means flat plus geometrically regular fibers. For what it's worth, um, and okay, so 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 uh, so we take it. We take a scheme S, and then we just fix a functor, contravariant functor, 
from schemes over S to sets. And we, we require that it's limit preserving. So I tried to spell out what this means here. It sort of means that for every direction of, of rings that, are, that live over your scheme S, that uh, it commutes with co-limits. Um, and so this seems like an abstract property at first, but let's just think that this co-limit here, this one, this, this can be really big. You know, for instance, any ring can be written as a union of its finitely generated Z subalgebras. So anything can be expressed as a co-limit of like a, fi a finite type Z algebras. Uh, and what this th then is saying, so this is really sort of like a finiteness condition on the functor. It's saying if you have an object defined over a possibly huge ring, then it actually comes from a, a, um, a, maybe a, a more uh, finite type, finitely generated ring. Uh, so right, if you have, so in other words, you have uh, spec of this colon, right, and this the maps go like this. And what this, if you have some object over this, let's just call it C. What this then is saying that you know for lambda big enough, whoops, for for lambda large enough there exists some element here living over it that restricts to your guy. So it's really sort of this finiteness condition. And uh, maybe sort of as an example, if X is a scheme, then you can look at this functor morphisms um, over S into X from schemes over S to sets. And then this, this functor is limit preserving if and only if X to S is locally a finite presentation. So it really is a, a finiteness condition. And it's often an easy condition to check for functors. Sorry, do you mean a contravariant functor? Yeah, a contravariant, yes. I couldn't fit that in here. Uh, okay, so we've, we've explained uh, sort of the starting point of this. We have a scheme and we have a functor. And then we, we take an element C hat defined over the completion of a point in S. Um, and then the, the, the conclusion is that you can approximate this then, then that there is an Atal neighborhood and an element that may not agree all the way up to the level of the completion, but at least at, up to this finite level. So these, these agree. Uh, and you know, I, maybe I should note that this map is residually trivial meaning that the residue field of S and S prime are equal. And therefore, since it's a tau, you know, the completions at S and S prime are isomorphic and therefore also all of their like nilpotent thickenings are, are equal. So it really makes sense to compare these two elements in, in here. Um, and in some cases you can actually arrange that it's equal to C hat at the level of completion if you add additional conditions like, like formal versality but then you're getting into uh, art and art and algebraization and, and more uh, and other variants of this. So this we'll use this at, at, at some at sometimes. Um, and maybe I should also relate this, this. This theorem is you know related to what this other approximation result called Naran Pathescu, which is at least as powerful, maybe arguably more powerful. Um, and what it says is this, is, is that if A to B is a regular ring homomorphism of Nethereum rings, then you can express B as a covenant of smooth ones. And note the big difference here uh, between like what a regular ring homomorphism is and a smooth one is the finite tightness of hypothesis, right? The map from the, a local ring to its completion um, is not finite type. So it's not really a, a smooth, it's not a smooth map, but this is saying that you can approximate any regular ring homomorphism by smooth morphisms. And therefore this, you can see how this excellent condition shows up because this map is regular, you can approximate 
the completion, if you wanted to, to show that Neuron Popescu implies our approximation, for instance, you could apply Neuron Popescu to this map uh, and, then, and then use that to see that you can at least approximate your element, um, maybe by a smooth morphism, but then by um, slicing that smooth morphism, you can actually bring it to be a tau. Um, but let's actually see one, one use of this, um, one use of this approximation result. Going back to, let's just revisit this case of nodes. Um, so, so for instance, if you wanted to apply approximation to see what we can construct it with our hands here, you can take, uh, you can take F to be the functor over the scheme C, the sets where, where you can just, where uh, a map C prime to C, you can just go maybe to the set. Let me, let me write it this way. Of, of decompositions, um, scheme theoretic decompositions of C prime as so maybe C prime one disjoint union C prime two. Or if you want to interpret this maybe more precisely or algebraically, you could think of this as uh, you maybe the in idempotent in C prime, which gives you this decomposition. Um, and and observe that. Like this, the fact that we know that the comp whoops, this this should be whoops, I put the hat in the wrong place here. No one corrected me. This should be whoops here. Uh, yeah, because this is 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 reducible, we have an element C hat of this functor defined over O hat C, C. And therefore, Artin approximation, even with using N equals one, uh, gives an etau cover. So that's a way to throw a really highbrow fancy theorem to, to, to see what we did just by taking a square root of X minus one. And, but, and in fact, you know, you can use art and approximation similarly on the same curve to show that a tau locally, um, the completion, um, yeah, to show that a tau locally, it just looks like x, y equals zero, which is essentially what this does. And, uh, and we'll use this in, in, in a powerful way later in the course to get a local structure theorem for, for nodes and even families of nodal curves, which will, which will be uh, useful. Any questions on this? Yeah, is this like full disjoint union decomposition or like irreducible component decomposition? Oh, I shouldn't write disjoint union. Yeah, yeah. I should guess I should it's irreducible. So I should write okay. union. Thank you. It's more of a yeah, a reducible decomposition. It's an irreducible, yeah, components. But I think more I think it's better to I mean if you really you wanted to get get it to work nicely, you should just take uh Look, parameterize idempotence, and then, and maybe as an exercise, check that that is that functor is uh, limit preserving. But then you have to take uh, zero divisors, right? So very important. Uh, yes, yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's the exercise, I guess, to work it out precisely. So sorry, this will be like some kind of uh, the underlying space will be like a profinite set or something. Or no, I'm not sure how to answer that. But if you if you like to think of it that way, sure, sure. I don't want to get well, into yeah. The okay. Easy. I was just saying like spec applied to an infinite product of fields kind of thing. All right, um, anyway, thanks. Yeah, let me avoid this for now. I'm, I'm sure there are some of these issues, and I think it's best to yeah. <laughs> If, uh, yeah, if people work them out themselves. All right, so that was my attempt at art and approximation. Let me give uh, a few other, let me just say quickly, another uh, way to motivate a tau morphisms is that, uh, is that, you know, there's this, which I won't say very much about, but, you know, it's, it's an incredible, incredibly powerful notion that's used to define a tau cohomology. And my very quick motivation here is that if you take uh, a smooth projective curve, um, say over the complex numbers, 
And you can, if, you, if you take a constant sheaf, you know, in the Zariski topology, the restrictions are surjective, so the sheaf is flat, so you have no cohomology in Zariski topology. But, uh, but if you go to the Italian topology, then it's, it's a theorem that you actually do have, have cohomology, and it, it looks just like 2G copies of your constant sheaf. And this is what you see like in the analytic topology, for instance. And so it's a it's got sort of, as an example, it indicates that it's more similar to the analytic topology. And of course, these have been used uh, you know, for wide ranging applications in algebraic geometry, topology, arithmetic geometry, number theory, like for instance, the Vey conjectures. Um, but I'm not really going to go into that. Um, and finally, but what, what will be very important for us is the applications to descent theory. And so I want to give a little spiel quickly about motiva motivating, um, like what is what is descent theory? Sorry, can I ask a quick question about uh, example three? So the vanishing yeah. of um, higher cohomology for constant sheaves, like I, I've seen that. Uh, is it true also that the higher cohomology of, I don't know, Zariski locally constant sheaves uh, on like an irreducible um, variety uh, also vanishes? Yeah, I guess, yeah, the higher cohomology of, of any, any sheaf. Oh, uh, any, any abelian sheaf. Oh, that's okay, right. cool. That's great, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I had I had an application of this, and I wasn't sure like the generality which it holds. Thanks. Uh, right. So, like, maybe to to frame this this quick this discussion of descent theory, let's recall that like sort of this growth index perspective that when you define a property of a morphism, it should be well behaved under certain notions. For instance, any property p uh, should be stable under composition certainly should be stable under base change. And good properties should also be sort of Zariski local on the target. And some might be even Zariski local on the source. And, and what that means is, is if I have, you know, if, if yi is a Zariski cover of, of a scheme y, you know, so this is written as a union, and, and, I, and I have a morphism x to y, to check that f has some property, has that property, it's equivalent to checking that all of these base changes has that property. So that, that's, that's what we mean by the risky local on the target. And certainly any, any property you can think of, of, of morphism of schemes, you know, properness, separatedness, uh, talentness, smoothness, a finite type, I mean, you name it, uh, it satisfies this property. Uh, and the point of descent theory is that the same thing is true in the Italian topology. Every morphism will, will also satisfy the same condition with respect to tau covers, um, and in fact, usually it, and more general and more general covers as well. Uh, and so, descent theory will sort of crop up a few times in this talk, but will crop up, you know, throughout this course. Um, and yeah, and we're going to use it sort of systematically. And I would argue that you really can't go far in modular theory without developing descent theory. And unlike some other topics, like like when it, like uh, art and approximation or so resolutions of surfaces, you know, which are genuinely difficult and take work to prove. I mean, descent theory is is uh, you can you can present in a very like self-contained way, in, like in a graduate course in just a week or two. I mean, the, the proofs are really kind of nice to go through, um, and the statements, yeah, everything is sort of uh, very conceptual. So I think so. My advice is, if you want, if you wanted to dive to dive into and learn this descent theory, it, it shouldn't. Uh, it's not that hard, and and unfortunately, there's a lot of good references for this material. I mean, I've written very little about it in my notes, other than some of the statements and made a couple arguments. But I recommend. I mean, the place I learned it was was at the book on Neuron Models, which has a chapter on descent theory that is fantastic. But I'm not really going to develop it systematically in the class, but I'm going to highlight it whenever I use it. OK, so I'm going to move on now to the more uh, formal introduction part of, the, of this class. I'm going to uh, introduce now sites. Well, I'll stop if anyone has questions.
All right, so as I said last time, we really need to expand our notion of a topology. We, we need to redefine the notion of a topology and we do it in the, within this growth and unique sense. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna define it. So it's written out here. Uh, so a growth and deep topology on a category S is, is a bunch of data. Is that way, let, let's try to piece of, so, for the, so for every object in your category, you need to give a set of coverings. And a covering itself is maybe a set of morphisms like this that, that yeah, should be well behaved. Uh, but before specifying what conditions we require, let me just go to the most basic example and see how it recovers the ordinary notion of a topological space. Um, so here, let's let X be top on the right-hand side, let X be a topological space. And you know, for the category S, I'm gonna take S to be this category. Uh, and it's the category of open sets. So an object of this category is just an open set of X. And morphisms, there's a unique morphism from B, oh, that was the eraser. There's a, a unique morphism from B to U, if and only if B is contained in U. So you can think of the, the morphisms being morphisms over X that are open immersions. Um, and so that, that defines the category, but there's also this other piece of data, which is the coverings. And so that's, and we define them as you expect, you know, a covering of an open set U is just a collection of open immersions, UI to U, such that the UI cover U. And that's all, that's, that's, yeah, that's all the data, that's the data that goes into it. And, uh, and it, it needs to satisfy these three conditions, which are really natural if you think about it. So let's first focus on one. One is just saying that an isomorphism should be a cover. You know, U is a cover for U uh, in the ordinary sense. And, and, um, and you should also be able to restrict cover. So if you look at this condition two, it's saying that, you know, if I have a cover of U and I have a map from B to U, I can restrict this cover along that map. And, and that this is, and then, this, and then you get a cover of B. And this is so like, if you think about what this is an ordinary topological space, if I have a cover of U and B is, sits inside U, if I just restrict that cover, I get a cover of B. Um, and finally, um, you should be able to compose covers. So this is maybe the composition of covers. Uh, if I have a cover of U by these UIs and covers of UI by these UIJs, then I can compose them to get a cover of U, and just like with the regular topology. Um, and then, so that defines a growth and topology, and a site is basically the same notion. A site technically is just a category with a growth and topology. But all, for all senses of purposes, you know, uh, but like the yeah, sites and growth and topologies are interchangeable. Um, that, that's the notion of a site. And let me give, uh, yeah, so uh, a second example, which is the small tau site of a scheme. So I take X to be a scheme, and, uh, and then I take the category of schemes a tau over X. So here an object is just an a tau morphism to X. So it's, 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 it's like in, in this uh, ordinary topological space case, but, uh, but uh, rather than taking open immersions, I relax that and consider a tau morphisms. Um, but this really is, you really do have to expand your mind here and to, to wrap your head around this because it's because like we're no longer dealing with, with, with just points and, and open sets. Now our open sets are not even, not, not inclusions. Right? Like these the tau maps can have uh, multiple fibers. I can have multiple points in a fiber. And then the coverings are defined uh, similarly here. And then you get the smaller tau site, which we'll use, but actually the main example we'll use is the bigger tau site, which is even a bigger uh, mind stretch because the category is enormous. So on the bigger tau site, we take the category to be all schemes, but again, restrict the coverings to just be a tau coverings. And we'll call, uh, we're gonna use the notation that schemes is the category of schemes, but then if I, if I write it with this subscript, then I, I, get, the, uh, I get the site. 
And it's not, I don't think it uh, would be a use for anyone here for me to like prove that these are sites. I think that's best done on your own. Um, so just check, yeah, check that these are sites. And I mean, there's, a, there's many other examples of sites that we could give, you know, rather than the big Atal site, I mean, you could define the big Zariski site in the same way. You can also define uh, big Atal sites relative to a scheme, you know, or, or just there's this way to always restrict sites along, along morphisms. Um, and there's also smooth or FPPF, FPQC sites. And uh, these really won't come up in this course. They're important, but uh, we won't use them. We will use flat descent at times, but usually not we don't need the full power. We usually will just have a morphism that's flat um, and quasi compact or flat and locally finite presentation. So we, yeah, we will use some flat descent, but uh, we'll, we'll, but in terms of sites, we'll use the, we'll, you're gonna just use the big top site. Um, yeah, and the last thing I wanted to, to say today uh, is uh, introduce is, is, is sheaves on sites. I'm gonna, unless there's questions, which I'll pause for a second, I'll move on to that. Uh, Jared? So I have a maybe, maybe kind of dumb question about the art and approximation theorem hypotheses. And it's kind of related to what we're talking about because, you know, like you can consider the category of schemes to technically be like the category of all schemes over spec Z. Wait, sorry, I missed that. Oh. So, so the category of schemes could be thought of as the category of all schemes over spec Z, right? Because yes. everybody's over spec Z. So the first hypothesis, right, which says let S be an excellent scheme. You know, if, if you think of, you know, you, you have the category of schemes over S. So if I take S to be spec Z, then, you know, everything's excellent in that case, or, or S is excellent. And then you, 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 it seems like you don't need the first hypothesis, but then maybe I'm missing something about the category that you want, like maybe you want to make sure that your base scheme is, is a certain scheme. Like, I, I don't know how to phrase this correctly. Well, I, I guess in the statement of a, a, an approximation, it's sort of important that we're in this relative setting where we're looking at functors over S. So when we apply it for the irreducible curve, we're applying it over C. Um, there, I don't think, it would, it would, yeah, I'm not sure how you would make, how you would get our approximation to work to get the desired reducibility statement if you just worked over spec Z in that case. Um, yeah, I see. Like you but, have to, you, you have to mm -hmm. worry about like what the base is. So it doesn't suffice to just consider things over spec Z. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah but, but you, you make a good point that in this class though, the way I'm gonna be defining objects like both algebraic spaces and stacks are over spec Z. Um, there's, this, there's this choice that you have to make when developing it. Do you work over spec Z or do you fix the scheme to begin with and then work over that scheme. But I, I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm gonna work over spec Z. Yeah, yeah, perfect, thank you. So yeah, moving on to sheaves, uh, I mean, the, de the definitions of pre-sheaves and sheaves are, are quite simple and you know very similar to what you've seen before with the Zariski topology. Uh, pre-sheaf is just a contravariant functor um, and I think throughout this course, when I say functor, you should assume it's, it's contravariant. Uh, I prefer to say that rather than using a, like the opposite uh, notation. Uh, so appreciate is just a contravariant functor and you can define appreciates on, on any category. But to define a sheaf, you, you, need, you need to have a notion of a topology to begin with. So, uh, so you, you, you define sheaves on a site and, uh, and the definition is that a sheaf a pre-sheaf is a sheaf if and only for every covering, this sequence is exact. Um, and so there's two parts of this. Well, first I should explain that um, these two maps are induced by the two projections. SI, oh, oops. Uh, and um, but the uh, the pullback, and um, so really, there's there's two parts of this exact sequence. One, there's the like this, there's injectivity here, and then with, with the injectivity is, is then saying 
you know, that uh, if I, uh, that, that if sections glue, they glue uniquely in the sense that, um, yeah, if I, if I have two different sections over S such that, that all their restrictions under these covering are equal, then it must have been equal to begin with. And, and then the, the, the uh, other part of this is the fact that sections glue in this topology. So this is just like with the, the uh, ordinary case. Um, and maybe, yeah, so like in the, like, so if you, if you have a topological space in this category of open sets, uh, I think to, in order to interpret this, it's always useful to remember that in the, when these are open sets, this fiber product is just the intersection. So this is saying what you usually think of when you have, uh, this is the, this obtains the usual notion of a sheath. Uh, and for a second example, we're going to consider these representable functors. So we, we take a scheme X uh, and we consider this functor HX, this functor which assigns to scheme S all morphisms to it. This is the functor that represents the scheme X. And the claim is that this is a sheaf in the big tau topology. Remember, this is the big tau topology. Uh, and the reason this is true is, is it comes from descent theory again. So let me also to motivate descent theory, let me explain this. Um, so if you think about what, what this means to be a sheaf would be, for instance, for gluing, if I have a bunch of objects over SI, so if I have a collection of objects like GI in this product of morphisms from SI to X, um, if they, to say that uh, that they agree on the overlaps is to say that you know that if I can if I can compose this way or this way that they're then they're, they're equal as maps. Um, so if you look if, we, if you go back to this diagram here, that would be that that, that is to say that oh that was the eraser. Uh, yeah, that is to say that yeah under these two different maps they're equal. Therefore, it should come from an element of f of s. The reason that is true is, is descent theory. Um, and right, so, so, the, the, so it's one of the results from descent theory is the statement that if I have a collection of morphisms GI that agree under these compositions, then there exists a unique map here filling in the diagram. Uh, and I should emphasize that when you restrict to the Zariski topology, this is a familiar fact, right? If you have open sets, then to define a morphism from S to X is suffices to define them on the open sets, and then you just need to check their intersections. So this is really this is a familiar fact. Um, it's also true more generally that you can this works in the flat topology. Uh, and at the bo bottom, I've highlighted, and I'll continue to highlight these abusive notations that I, I'd rather than using HX, I'm always rather than using HX. I'm going to use X. So I'm going to conflate, yeah, this the scheme with the functor or the scheme with the sheath. And uh, no, and yeah, the last thing I need to introduce is fiber products, and and then uh, then we can move on to this discussion. And fiber products are actually quite easy. Uh, so if we if we have a if we have a pair of morphisms from F to G. And G prime to G, and just say they're they're maps of, of, of pre sheaths on a category. Um, then to define the fiber product as pre sheaths, you do you just take it uh, you take you do the naive thing where you you just assign to you take the functor that assigns to scheme S sort of the fiber product of these things. Um, and the fact is that this is a fiber product in the category of pre sheaths. Um, and as a simple exercise, I would urge you to check that if you started with things that were sheaves on a site, then the, the fiber product of the functors is also uh, a sheaf. So in other words, we have fiber products in this category of, of, of sheaves on a site.
Um, and the last thing, piece, that, uh, piece of data that we'll need is this notion of sheathification, which works like, just like you've seen in your first course in algebraic geometry. Uh, and uh, so it works on any sites. And the statement, or well, one way to make the statement is that the forgetful functor has a left adjoint. I, personally, I can never remember the difference between left adjoints and right adjoints. And it's always helpful for me to spell this out. And so what this means is that, um, is that if, so you have, you have your uh, pre-sheath F, it, it, it admits a map to the sheathification. And the universal property that it should satisfy is that for any other sheath G on the site S, there should exist a unique factorization of this. And if you translate what this, what this means, this means that homomorphisms uh, in the category of pre sheaths from F to your sheet G, where you've like, it is a sheet, but then you've, you've forgotten that it's a sheet and you're viewing it as a pre sheet, is equal to homomorphisms in the category of sheaths from the sheathification of F to G. Uh, and and this is not a difficult fact. I'm not going to go through all the details, but uh, it is the, the proof works just like with schemes and Zariski topology. And and uh, and so, for for instance, uh, I like to view this as a two-part process. So we're going to introduce this notion of a separated pre-sheaf, and a pre separated pre-sheaf just means that uh, that like if sections, like basically if sections glue. They glue uniquely. So, in other words, the first map in that sequence was injective. Um, and if we take this the full subcategory of pre-sheaves, then we're going to construct a sequence of, of left adjoints going from pre-sheaves to separated pre-sheaves and then to sheaves. And and to define these, I mean, you do what you think you you do. Like for instance, if you take a pre-sheaf F, if it's not a separated pre-sheaf then uh, you have multiple sections restricting to the same sections. So you just remove them. So you just mod out by this equivalence relation, forcing the, the gluing of sections to be unique. And you do a similar thing here uh, to define the second sheathification. Uh, here you have a separated pre-sheath, but you may not have enough sections allowing you to glue. So you just like arbitrarily force them to glue by defining this enormous functor uh, and then, uh, and uh, it, which by definition is, is forced to be uh, a sheath with glue that, so you can glue your sections. And the fact that these are ad, adjoints, um, you know, it, there's, there's details. I mean, it does take work, uh, but I think it's one of these things that's better done on your own, um, especially in this context of virtual courses. Uh, but that, yeah, that was my main goal for today. So I think I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll just have the rest of the class will be a, a discussion.